Absent an 83B election, a founder who receives shares of common stock subject to vesting will have to recognize as income and pay taxes on the appreciation in the value of the stock on the day that it vests, even if the founder has not sold any of the stock and cannot sell any of the stock because the company is not yet publicly traded. This is a horrible outcome for a founder because he or she will become a victim of the startup's success, paying a higher and higher tax bill as the company appreciates in value. What's even worse is that that tax bill does not drop even if the shares never become publicly traded or the founder never gets liquidity in the shares. With an 83B election, the founder defers recognizing the gain on the appreciation of the shares until he or she sells the stock and thus has cash to pay the taxes. But 83B elections can only be filed during the first 30 days after the founder receives the stock subject to vesting and there is no mechanism for late filings. Founders should plan to incorporate their startups and buy their founder stock for a de minimis purchase price as early as possible when the company arguably has its least value. After intellectual property has been created, a team has been assembled, and investor interest has been piqued, a startup is no longer able to issue founder shares for a de minimis purchase price. We see some founders suffer the problem of delayed incorporation where they contact us to form their startups at the same time as they have received investment interest. Ideally, several weeks should pass between the founder purchasing stock for a de minimis purchase price and the company raising its seed capital. Each time a startup achieves a significant milestone, such as a capital raise, the price at which it can sell employee stock or grant employees options increases to reflect the increase in the company's valuation. We see some startups expose themselves and their employees to significant tax risk by failing to increase the price at which they grant stock options out of a misguided desire to help their employees by granting discounted stock options. Some startups shoot themselves in the foot by failing to obtain good title to the intellectual property upon which their startups are based. For example, many online and corporation packages fail to affect assignments of intellectual property, including pre-incorporation intellectual property, from founders to the startup. If the founder group fractures, the failure to obtain these assignments results in disputes over who owns the intellectual property upon which the company is based. Similarly, some startups fail to obtain valid invention assignment agreements from each employee or consultant that contributes to the company's product, again introducing the risk of disputes over who owns the IP. Finally, some startups neglect to follow clean licensing practices and either build products that cannot be sold to customers without infringing the rights of third parties or exposing the startup's entire code base to open source licensing obligations. Some startups expose themselves to trade secret misappropriation claims of prior employers as a result of overlapping employment or unclean departures from prior employers. As protective as the law is of creative entrepreneurs who want to launch new companies, the law is equally protective of prior employers' trade secrets and former employees' obligations not to take advantage of their prior employers.